Hey guys, Colin here, and welcome back to Fight for Truth, the channel where we bring you Christian commentary about the things that matter. In today's video, we're going to be talking about another sermon clip from Sarah Jakes. She is the daughter of Bishop T.D. Jakes, who is the pastor of Potter's House Church in Dallas, Texas. It now seems that Sarah Jakes will be sort of taking over for her father when he decides to step away from ministry. There was recently some sort of ceremony wherein TD passed the torch to Sarah, and this involved some sort of charismatic slaying in the spirit event. It was all very bizarre. But in any case, Sarah is just as much a false teacher as her father is. For starters, she should not be in any form of church leadership considering she's a woman, and God expressly says that male headship over the church is his his standard. But secondly, Sarah takes the Bible out of context, really all the time, for the sake of motivation and hype. In today's video, we're going to show you exactly how she does this and how unbiblical it really is. So first, let's see what text of scripture Sarah will be working with today. Watch this. Luke 8 and 49. Okay, it says, while he was still speaking, someone came from the ruler of the synagogue's house saying to him, your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the teacher. Now, because she will be preaching from Luke chapter 8, it will be beneficial for us to do a brief overview of the story here. This is the account of when Jesus heals Jairus' daughter. Luke 8, 41 through 42 says this, quote, And there came a man named Jairus, who was a ruler of the synagogue. And falling at Jesus' feet, he implored him to come to his house, for he had an only daughter, about 12 years of age, and she was dying. After this, Jesus is seemingly interrupted with the healing of the woman who had a discharge of blood. Someone from Jairus' house then comes to them and says this in verse 49, quote, Your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the teacher anymore. And by the time Jesus gets to the man's house, verse 52 says, quote, All were weeping and mourning for her. In other words, it seems externally that Jesus has arrived too late. The girl is dead. Yet Jesus says in verse 52, quote, Do not weep, for she is not dead, but sleeping. And in the end, verse 54 says, quote, Taking her by the hand, he, Jesus, called, saying, Child, arise. And her spirit returned, and she got up at once. That is the passage, that's the story that we're going to be talking about here. But let's go ahead and see what Sarah Jakes got out of this text. Watch this. And her parents were astonished, but he charged them to tell no one what had happened. My subject for those of you who like to take notes is, girl, get up. Girl, get up. So she states her theme, and this already sounds like it's going to be an unbiblical motivational speech that will immediately take all of this story out of context and individualize it for everyone in the room. Where have we seen that before? And by the way, she's actually preaching at a women's conference here, just to give you some context, and she takes Jesus' statement, Child, Arise, and makes it into the trendy sermon title, Girl, Get Up. This sermon has over 3.5 million views, and again, we're off to a bad start here. But I suppose it depends on what she means specifically by this phrase, so let's give her the benefit of the doubt and keep watching. Check this out. And I was studying, and when the text continues, I think it's important for us to realize that when her father first meets Jesus, the little girl is not dead yet. That when her father first has an encounter with Jesus, that he says, my daughter is sick. Because you don't just turn off, you don't just die. There is this slow fading of your hope, this slow fading of your healing, this slow fading of your purpose. God help me because I know I'm in the right room. So apparently, this little girl in the story can be used as a sort of metaphor for the slow fade of your, quote, hope and purpose. It's really unclear where Sarah is getting this from the passage, or really any passage at all. It seems like quite a leap. But rest assured, the Bible actually gives us a great spiritual way of understanding this. One where we don't have to make up our own story or our own conclusions. We can actually believe what the Bible says. So here's a question. What is the primary meaning of death and resurrection in the Christian life? What is the primary spiritual meaning of being brought to life by Jesus from a state of being in deadness? The answer is one word salvation. And if you study the scriptures on this, it's very, very clear as a pattern. Galatians 2.20, quote, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. 
death and resurrection through salvation. Romans 6.23, quote, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Again, death and resurrection through salvation, death and life through Christ. But maybe these are just vague coincidences. Surely there aren't any clear examples of this being taught in Scripture, right? Well, let's see. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, quote, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Verse 4 goes on, quote, But God, being rich in mercy, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Surely it doesn't get any more clear than that. This miracle from Jesus is a practical and physical example of a spiritual reality that happens to every single Christian in salvation. It's not about your hope dying or your purpose dying. It's about being dead in sin and being made alive in Christ. But let's keep watching because it gets even worse. Watch this. And the daughter is sick and she goes from sick to dead. She goes from sick to dead, and you know what happened in between her going from sick to dead? Jesus was healing other people. I felt like, wow, this has got to be training ground for what it feels like to be a woman. Because there are so many moments where parts of our dreams and our desires go from just being sick to dead because we were trying to make sure other people were healed. that some of us put our lives on the back burner. Now, that's all very sweet and sentimental, but it has nothing to do with what the passage actually said. First off, this little girl wasn't helping anyone to get their healing. That simply never happened. Sarah Jakes is reading that into the story so that she can make her audience feel good about themselves. It's a classic false teacher move. It basically goes something like this. I know you've had a hard time, girl, but girl, you just need to get up. You're just like the little girl who was dying in the story. Don't you sometimes feel that way? Don't you get sad? Your dreams are sick and dead because you were helping everyone else to get their healing. You're so kind, so selfless, but don't worry. Jesus is coming to your house now. It's your turn to get your miracle. He's going to resurrect all of your hopes and your dreams. Girl, get up. You see how this works? She's stroking the ego of her audience rather than actually sticking with the text. And in so doing, she ends up fabricating events that simply never happened. But speaking of things that never happened, this passage is not about your personal, quote, hopes and dreams dying. And here's why. If your hopes and dreams are the little dead girl in the story, then that is what Jesus has to resurrect at the end of the story. In other words, Sarah Jakes is promising all of the women in the audience that whatever their hopes and dreams are, fill in the blank, Jesus will resurrect them. He will bring them back to life. But that's not a promise actually given in Scripture, not even close. Proverbs 19.21 says, quote, Many are the plans in the mind of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. You see, your plans, your dreams, your desires are not guaranteed to be granted. And the fact that Sarah Jakes is using this passage to assert that is simply false. I wish I could say it's going to get better, but the doctrine here only gets worse. So my dream has gone from sick to dead. And so when we meet Jairus in the text, his little girl has gone from sick to dead. And in the verse, in the verse when it begins, there's a man who comes up to Jairus and says, don't worry, the teacher anymore. Your dream is dead. So now, Sarah has actually quoted the passage of Scripture and inserted her own word into it as if that was in the Bible. This is particularly dangerous and seriously unbiblical. The actual passage says in verse 49, if you remember, quote, Your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the teacher anymore. Sarah intentionally misquotes it to advance her point, saying, quote, Do not trouble the teacher anymore. Your dream is dead. This is the epitome of false teaching, literally swapping your own words for God's word so that you can make a point that will motivate your audience. And through all of this, it's helpful to remember that, again, death and resurrection in the Christian life is not about your personal dreams. It's about salvation through Jesus Christ. In other words, this is a perfect chance to preach the gospel. She's at a conference, after all. To preach deadness and sin, being made alive through Christ, through faith and by grace. You could preach all these things. 
But instead of doing that, instead of preaching the truth of God's word and the gospel of Christ, Sarah goes in the exact opposite direction. In this kind of sermon, Jesus doesn't primarily want to save you from your sins. No, he wants to resurrect your hopes and your dreams. In all honesty, this sermon might as well be ripped straight out of a Disney movie or a seminar from Tony Robbins. Follow your heart, reach for the stars, work for your dreams, make a big wish, and blow out the candles, because God's going to give you everything you want. This kind of weak-willed, self-focused Christianity is going to crash and burn before it gets off the spiritual runway. Why? Because it is absent of any biblical truth. It has no roots in the Word of God. In fact, it actively ignores the Word of God for the sake of emotion, motivation, sensationalism, and hype. Essentially, Sarah Jakes just butchered the Bible beyond recognition right in front of you for the sake of motivating her audience. We must refute this stuff. We must seek biblical teaching from true men of God who teach the Word properly with reverence and respect. This is where true wisdom and encouragement will come from, and we ought to thank the Lord for these things with joy. In any case, that is our doctrinal review of this sermon from Sarah Jakes. I pray that this has been a blessing to you, and please know that this video isn't meant as a sinful attack, but rather as a biblical critique. And let's pray for Sarah, that she would stop this false teaching by God's grace and turn to the truth of God's Word. Thank you so much for watching that video. Please give us a like and subscribe so that you don't miss any content. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our Rumble channel as well, just in case YouTube ever takes us down. The link is in the description. And before you go, take a look at this list here. These are the people who make all of the free content you see on this channel possible with their monthly support. Today's highlighted channel supporter is Benjamin A. If you also want to help and become part of the solution today, hit the link in the description. Your support keeps us independent and helps us immensely here on the channel. So I hope you'll consider joining the Truth Army today, and until next time, fight for truth, never surrender, and keep your eyes open. Thank you, and God bless.